I'm Jonathan Arnold, one of your hosts this evening, and it's an honor to have Dr. Fred Sanders with us to present on Hillary. Dr. Fry, our co-host this evening, will be introducing him in a minute, but I wanted to first say a few words about our ministry. Uh, Holy Joys exists to bring theology to bear on the beliefs and practices of local churches, especially in the Wesleyan tradition, so that they can be more holy and happy. We believe that theology is for the church, and we enjoy helping ordinary believers in the local church to see the beauty of doctrine so that they can experience deeper satisfaction in God. And this includes a strong commitment to Methodist Catholicity, tapping into the riches of our ancient faith to help serve the needs of the contemporary church. Uh, our Ad Fontes reading group has been one effort in this direction. Um, several of the 28 pastors, students, and educators in our group were unable to be here tonight, but this will be recorded, shared with them, and then published online for a wider audience. You can watch for that video at holyjoys.org, as well as on the Holy Joys podcast, where Dr. David Fry and I have weekly discussions on theology and ministry practice. Uh, before I talk, turn it over to Dr. Fry, who will be moderating the Q&A later this evening, uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to Dr. Sanders for his deep influence on my life. Uh, he doesn't know this, but uh, he's one of my heroes, so I have a little bit of that celebrity anxiety tonight <laughs> as I'm in the, the Zoom chat with him. Uh, but some of you know that I didn't, wasn't really raised in church. I came to faith reading the Bible as a public school teenager, started attending a local Wesleyan church, and it quickly developed a love for theology but realize it's kind of hard to find Wesleyans who are doing serious theology. And I wondered if Wesleyans could do serious theology. And then I stumbled across Fred Sanders. And the first time someone told me that he was a Wesleyan, I thought that it must be a mistake. Uh, but I was, I was glad that it wasn't. And uh, it was also Dr. Sanders who made, helped me make sense of my conversion. Um, I was a really unhappy and miserable teenager. Um, and uh, it was like one day I was just swept up in the gospel of the happy God. And Dr. Sanders said, because God is happy, the omnipotent happiness of God is coming to get you. And I think about that line almost every day because it came and got me and I'm eternally grateful for that. And it's largely uh, explanatory of my emphasis on happiness and that theme that I found deep in Wesley's works. Um, I, uh, I know that he's inspired many others to love the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with their whole heart and mind. I uh, also appreciate his work and heart for the church. It was Dr. Sanders who first introduced me to the great Methodist theologian William Burt Pope, who is now my historical hero. And in a short article on Pope, Dr. Sanders writes, you have to understand what doctrine is for. It's not for theologians, it's for churches. And I believe that he exemplifies this in his own work. Uh, Michael F. Byrd identifies renewed Trinitarian theology as one of four things that is necessary to renew the evangelical churches, and uh, I can think of no one who has addressed this need better than Fred Sanders. Uh, my friend Paul Ryan, who is here tonight, says that everyone has a question, something they ask about everything in life, and he once told me that my question is, what does this have to do with the Trinity? And if that is true, it is because of the influence of Fred Sanders. Uh, his book, The Deep Things of God, How the Trinity Changes Everything, is high on my list of books that every pastor and every Christian, for that matter, should read. Uh, it's, it's a phenomenal work and has deeply shaped my own thinking. Um, also recommend The Triune God, uh, another work on the Trinity. And then uh, as Wesleyans, recommend his work on Wesley uh, on the Christian life. Take advantage of those. Uh, but of course, his most important works uh, are his Dr. Doctrine's Christian comics. Um, definitely uh, the magnus opus of Sanders' works. We need to retrieve those. And I can't wait till my little boy is old enough so daddy can read them with him. Uh, although he'll probably think I'm a little weird, which I probably am. So anyway, for theology nerds, you got to check those out. But what a joy to have Dr. Sanders here. Thank you so much for your influence on my life. Appreciate it. Thanks. Great to meet you. Uh, in Zoom, at least, Jonathan. Yes, sir. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, Fred, and I appreciate years ago you reading my dissertation and uh, for Tom McCall making that connection there. Uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Sanders to all of our listeners, he is the professor of theology at Biola University, has taught at Torrey Honors College since 1999 in 
uh, La Mirada, California. Uh, he is ordained to the Evangelical Church Alliance ministers at his local church, Grace Evangelical Free Church. Uh, he has authored, co-authored a, n- a number of books, some which uh, Jonathan Arl just mentioned. Uh, he, you have an upcoming book this year, Fount- uh, Fountain of Salvation, Trinity and Soteriology by Erdman. So I look forward to getting that. Uh, dozens of articles, chapters, papers. Uh, you can go on YouTube and find uh, material there as well. And some sermons, I think, as well on, on there. I think uh, Jonathan referenced or quoted from one of your sermons earlier. Uh, so thank you for being with us tonight. We're talking about Hillary of Poitiers and uh, very excited to uh, get some expertise on this uh, lesser known figure from the early church. And so we're going to take the next 35 minutes or so and I'll let you present on that. And then we'll have some questions for you. Great. Thanks a lot for having me here. Thanks for those introductions. And um uh, just encouraged to hear of groups out there reading, you know, reading the Church Fathers. Uh, such a great legacy, and um, just there aren't a lot of uh, sort of cultural forms for Protestants or Wesleyans in particular to just sort of like treat it as a normal part of our Christian life to be engaging the great tradition in that way. But uh, the, it's it's self recommending once you get into it. Once once you sort of get the trailhead of what's going on in the Fathers, you realize, oh, this is. This is where all the good stuff is. I, I think of uh, Tom Oden, the Methodist theologian, who was challenged by a Jewish colleague, uh, to, you know, to uh, enter into ecumenical dialogue with them. But um, it was Will Herberg, I think, who told him, like, Tom, I, you're a great guy, but I'm going to quit talking to you until you actually know the Christian tradition, because you're just making stuff up you thought of while reading Kierkegaard. But if you were serious, you'd be reading the Fathers. Then we could talk. And uh, Oden took that slap down in, in the best spirit and began reading uh, the ancient Christian tradition. So yeah, Hilary of Poitiers is a, um, he's a lesser known um, figure, but once you tune into him, you'll start spotting him everywhere. He is um, widely quoted. Uh, Calvin will interact with him. Um, he shows up in a number of sort of key quotation chains that, that get um, transmitted down through the ages. Um, but because he is lesser known in his own right, um, we tend to sort of begin teaching him by comparing him to others. And so for a long time, he's been known as the Athanasius of the West, Um, which is, you know, if you're trying to get your bearings on what kind of figure is this, uh, then there are some important similarities there. He's pretty close to contemporary with Athanasius. So I think, let's see, I had to write this down because I'm bad at remembering numbers. Um, Athanasius' dates are probably around 297 to 373, and Hillary is around 310 to 367. So they're they're contemporaries. Athanasius lived a longer life, started earlier, and, and lived longer. Um, and then, you know, the Athanasius of the West, they say. What he, the way in which he's like Athanasius is that he was a staunch defender of pro-Nicene theology after the Council of Nicaea. So, you know, the quick history of the Nicene theology in the fourth century is um, the good guys won at the Council of Nicaea, but it didn't matter because for the next 50 years, for a variety of reasons, mostly having to do with the sort of imperial control and, and uh, just who was in charge of the major city churches. Um, it was actually Arian theology most frequently in power, so that pro Nicene theology was kind of a resistance movement from the underside um, for those crucial decades of the fourth century. Athanasius was exiled, I think, five times. Um, Hillary was exiled by uh, Arians in control of things there in w- what is now France. Um, um, I think only once, I'm a little sketchy on some of the details of his biography, but it was a long exile during which he went to Asia Minor and, um, uh, as the story goes, just really interacted directly with Greek language theology so that he sort of stored that up, came to understand it, wrote a book in Latin explaining what the East means by what they say and kind of why they talk funny. So a real influx of um, Eastern uh, theology um, at, at that time in his work. So, um, yeah, shares that sort of um, exile, shares that sort of uh, had an important bishopric, uh, but was was uh, cast out of it, and also shares with Athanasius, I think, the um, direct verse-to-verse combat with Arian theology. You know, Athanasius' most famous work is on the Incarnation, but his longest, most sustained work is the Orations Against the Arians, which really is just a 
series of fights over contested Bible verses where he shows the proper pronicing construal of them. Hillary's 500 page on the Trinity is something like that. It's, um, it is a tour through major passages of scripture, um, usually that are contested. There's a, there's a very polemical anti-Aryan element to this. Um, and he's just uh, working in that way. Hillary seems to have been an adult convert to Christianity. So he was sort of um, intellectually established um, uh, when he heard the claims of the gospel and turned his attention to the Bible's claims. And you get that, of course, in what is, I think, one of the most um, um, charming elements of his book on the Trinity is that it starts with this autobiographical sort of section about his quest for truth and for the meaning of life. Um, so it's partly kind of an epistemological introduction to the doctrine of the Trinity. How would we know this about God? But he puts it in the first person and really frames it in this sort of classical style as a, um, a quest for happiness or the good life. He uses a couple of different phrases, but if you've read some Cicero and then you pick up Hillary on the Trinity, you think, oh, I recognize this. He is seeking the good life and asking in a philosophical mode, what makes for the good life? What brings about um, the state of happiness or uh, fulfillment of, of the human being. Um, so it's organized as the quest for the Trinity as the highest good, uh, but with this nice, nice biographical element. Uh, um, the handoff, I think, you know, it's 500 pages long. Um, almost all the quotes you ever see from it are for the, from the first three books. And I think it's um, Edmund Hill, the uh, translator of Augustine, who, who says, it might be naughty to think this, but since all the quotes are from the early books, it could be that nobody ever finishes Hillary's on the Trinity. Um, Hill even suggested that maybe even Augustine didn't finish reading it, but really liked the part he did read and quoted it quite a bit. Um, so if you didn't finish Hillary's on the Trinity, you're not alone. There, there may be a long Christian tradition of starting the book um, and realizing, I think it's going to be 500 pages of more of the same, which is you know, good stuff, but um, what's next on the list? Um, there is, it has this really warm um, uh, start that's uh, an earnest soul seeking truth, but basically fairly quickly in book one, it turns into, and then I picked up the Bible, and here's what I found in the Bible. And so the whole rest of the book is what I read in the Bible that convinced me that the first truth is the truth of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so. I, I saw it, I saw it, I looked and looked, then I turned to scriptures, and when I turned there, I found this. So the book's structure is basically canvassing scripture. Um, the really strong point of that is Hillary is very eloquent about the fact that the Trinity is not something made known through natural or general revelation, um, but it has to be told to us by God. So if you think about the sort of clarity that Thomas Aquinas brings to that discussion, right? Aquinas thinks that from um, properly functioning natural reason, you can demonstrate the existence of God, but certainly not the um, essence of God or the triunity of God. Um, so there's a handoff there from what you can make known from general uh, properly functioning reasoning to what must be revealed by God. Hillary, way back in the fourth century, has got that in spades, and he's got a, a, a number of wonderful statements where he says, if we are to know this thing about God, we are going to have to hear it from him. So a phrase that I think Calvin and then following Calvin Warfield will quote a lot is, God is the most fit witness of himself. Um, so it's a very revelation-centered uh, focus on the Trinity. And by revelation, Hillary fundamentally means scriptural. Um, so that's the underlying theology of revelation that, that gives uh, his book its shape. Um, here's a short quotation to that effect from uh, chapter 18 of book one. Since then, we are to discourse of the things of God. Let us assume that God has full knowledge of himself and bow with humble reverence to his words. For he whom we can only know through his own utterance is the fitting witness concerning himself. So that's book one, uh, section 18. Um, now, lest that sound almost fundamentalistic or just like show me the verses and I'll write them down and do my theology, um, Hillary also has a, a great emphasis on the personal transformation in the theologian that is necessary to read or hear that witness of God correctly. It's not just that God wrote a book so you can consult the book and find out what's true about God. 
though you know, in a sense that's true. But Hillary also complements that with an emphasis on the transformation of the reader and how it takes the work of God. Uh, we would say, using later terminology, we talked about the doctrine of illumination, right? That the same spirit who inspired the writing of the scriptures must inspire the proper reading of the scriptures. Um, and doesn't just, um, doesn't just illumine the reader so that they see things that weren't there before, like a kind of a magic eye trick sort of a thing, um, but illumines the reader by actually transforming that person in relation to God. So um, again, in section 18 of book one, Hillary says, uh, the new faculties of the regenerate intellect are needed. Each must have his understanding enlightened by the heavenly gift imparted to the soul. So um, if we're speaking among Wesleyans here, I can point to the pietist tradition of the 18th century about the new spiritual senses. Um, you get that either in Edward's way of talking about it or in John Wesley's more low to the ground. For Wesley, it was almost a preaching trick, right? Like you need spiritual eyes so you can see God, spiritual ears so you can hear God, spiritual sense of smell so you can savor him. Um, but you definitely get that here, the, the new faculties of the regenerate intellect that can meet the revelation, the self-revelation of God as he testifies to himself in scripture. I didn't take notes on this, but um, there is also a really wonderful element of Hillary's Trinitarianism where he, he can say it sort of merely monotheistically, God is the fit witness of himself, or he can add the Trinitarian way of putting it and say, the father bears witness to the son and the son bears witness to the father in the spirit. And he'll even sometimes make lists um, that start with the father, identifying who the son is, go through the son, talking to the father in prayer and identifying who the father is, talking about how we know of that because of the witness, um, because of the um, spirit's inspiration of scripture where we read these statements by the father and the son witnessing to each other. And then he'll work down through the apostolic witness and the witness of the evangelist and the witness of the martyrs. So it's a long string of testimony that begins within the Trinity. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute when I talk about his commentary on the Psalms. Um, probably the high point of this emphasis on our transformation as we learn of the Trinity from the Trinity is the prayer at the very end of book one. Um, and this is a prayer that's um, it's been widely quoted. It shows up in a couple of John Webster essays. Um, let me just read a little section of that from the very end of book one. Hillary says, we hope therefore that you, God, will set in motion the beginning of our timid venture and will encourage it by a steady progress and will summon us to share in the prophetic and apostolic spirit in order that we may understand their words in no other sense than that in which they spoke them and that we may explain the proper meaning of the words in accordance with the realities they signify. So the the invocation here, the need for God's help in the office of the interpreter of scripture. And it's just so straightforwardly put there, the, um, that we may understand their words in no other sense than that in which they spoke them. That's so good. I had to look up the Latin to see if it was really like that um, or if the translator had put that in there. And what I learned is that Hillary's Latin is pretty hard and I don't know. <laughs> He's um, um, classicist compare him unfavorably to Augustine's polish. Of course, Augustine was like a PhD in rhetoric, so, um, and he was a, a super genius of another type. Um, Hillary's apparently a little more pedestrian than that, but he's not writing a kind of scholastic Latin of the type that I can make some headway in, so. Um, and then, of course, taking seriously the, not only the interpreter's need to have divine power in understanding the true sense of scripture, but also the teacher's need for the divine power that we may explain the proper meaning in accordance with the realities they signify. And that's a, it's, it's subtle there, but it's an indication that we don't just have our noses in books doing proper hermeneutics according to the discipline of historical grammatical reading. We are, we are understanding those words in light of the realities they signify, right? There's the skylight to the reality of the Trinity itself, um, which is not only textually mediated, but is also divinely present to us. Um, well, there's much more there, uh, but every line of that prayer is, is kind of a, a classic. That's the, that is, um, that deserves to be the hit single off of Hillary's very long concept album on the Trinity. Um, 
so yes, it is a Bible study. It's not as carefully organized as Augustine's on the Trinity. Uh, it always suffers by comparison to Augustine's on the Trinity. But I would also say, um, by being less of a speculative genius, Hillary goes further in biblical study, and um, he doesn't he doesn't distract his readers um, in the way that Augustine does. I think it's fair to say that for a thousand years, readers of Augustine's on the Trinity tended to get very distracted by the quest for the image or the likeness of the Trinity within the human soul, which is kind of a, a final exercise Augustine does there to sort of take the biblical and philosophical work he's done to the next level by doing it in a more inward way, which is kind of appropriate to his neoplatonic leanings. Uh, Hillary never goes there. And so you could say, well, he's a little bit more of a pedestrian author, right? He's just kind of just doing the Bible study. Um, you could also say he, he could be a more effective teacher and that he's, he's not introducing a really sticky sermon illustration, which is all anyone goes home and talks about, right? Like, can't remember what passage the preacher was talking about, but he told this story. Um, Hillary doesn't make that mistake. Um, he may make the opposite mistake of being a little bit too plotting in his exegesis. Um, now, as he works through uh, a range of scripture, it's a little hard to organize or outline. Uh, Manlio Simonetti, the patristic scholar, said, um, Hillary's Trinitarianism is, quote, founded on a scriptural basis of unusual breadth. Um, and I think what, what Simonetti is getting at there is um, a number of statements from the Gospel of John are sort of the high road through the development of the doctrine of the Trinity in the early church. Um, just the way John puts it is ready to go for theological argumentation. So it's um, T.E. Pollard who wrote a book about Johannine Christology and the early church, where he just basically says, well, if it weren't for John, you wouldn't have the doctrine of the Trinity looking or sounding anything like it does. But if it weren't for John, you also wouldn't have Arianism. It's like that, that is just the, the happy, uh, that is the happy source of all the arguments. When Simonetti says that Hillary's Trinitarianism is founded on a scriptural basis of unusual breadth, I think he's accurately pointing to the fact that Hillary, more than a lot of other church fathers, is throwing the net very wide, true to his testimony. He really does seem to have picked up the Bible to say, apparently this is a guide to the highest good. And so he really jumps in and is just all over the place. He's using the Synoptic Gospels. He's interacting with Paul. He's got a lot of Hebrews and he's got... Um, He's got a lot of Old Testament, and I think his Old Testament interpretation is pretty heavy-handed. He is really finding Trinitarian stuff all over the place in the Old Testament, um, uh, much of which I think stands up, and, and reading retroactively, retrospectively from the New Testament, you can say, yeah, that's very insightful. Some of it you kind of put a little question mark in the margin of your book and think, mm, is that, I, I don't know if I can defend that with, with a clean conscience. He, he might be sort of projecting there. Um, but at any rate, he's, he's gathering in a lot of stuff. Nevertheless, I think it's Christopher Kaiser who pointed out that a couple of basically Johannine motifs are guiding much of what Hillary does. If he had to boil down his Trinitarianism, it's something like um, the son is God from God and God in God. So it's this sort of dynamic of He's sent from God because he, he is born of God eternally, um, and yet he's sent without departing from God so that you can't separate him or talk about God without the Son because God was always in God. So you can kind of feel a Johannine dynamic there of back and forth. Um, God from God, God in God. Now, um, if you check histories of doctrine until very recently, I think they all highlight as Hillary's major contribution his way of talking about the birth of the son. Um, so what you've got here is, a, uh, I think, a decision, a strategic decision about how to communicate the eternal generation of the son. If what you've got is the eternal generation of the second person of the Trinity, on the one hand, and the birth of Christ incarnate uh, from the Virgin Mary, on the other hand, you've got a decision to make about whether you use the same word for both of those and then distinguish them from each other, or whether you carefully do not use the same word. So you could say, on the one hand, there's the birth from Mary. We celebrate that at Christmas. On the other hand, there's the eternal generation, which is not a birth, but is a begetting. Um, and begetting is sort of like the male equivalent of birth, right? It's um, you're born from a mother, but begotten by a father. 
We don't really have a lot of great English words for that. We could say sired, but that sounds like a racehorse. We could say fathered, but that sounds like a, a parenting relationship that goes on through time as opposed to being the origin. And we don't have a great masculine equivalent of birth. Um, Hillary in On the Trinity definitely invests in the word birth, nat nativitas, um, and talks about the son being um, born from the father. Once you've decided that, then your teaching style is always going to be, on the one hand, there's the birth from, from Mary. On the other hand, there's the birth from the father. The birth from the father is an eternal birth. It's a, uh, the, the first primal eternal divine nativity of the son. And then you do your standard moves with eternal generation. You say like, there was never when it was not, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think that's right. And if you read a couple of books of On the Trinity, you'll see him using that all the time. It's got some communicative disadvantages, right? Um, you're always gonna be worried when you're preaching at Christmas time that people are gonna think the baby in the manger is the beginning of the son of God. And you think, well, you know better than that, right? And so you have to kind of talk people back into it and say, behind the birth from the Virgin is the birth from the Father. Um, here are some advantages to it. You could talk about a, a birth, a nativity, a, a natus, as producing a nature. And since the son has two births, he has two natures, right? Two nativities, two natures. Your nature is something you're born with. That's it. At least in English, that's the etymology of that word for us. We don't always think about that etymology. But you can see how that kind of lines up where two natures Christology comes right of, out of two births. Of course, you're going to have to double down and say the divine nature is necessary and essential and, and um, uh, is always indistinguishable from the eternal identity of the son as son. But the human nature is for us and our salvation, an act of grace, a free choice of God to save us through the hypostatic union. There's one other advantage, this gets a little bit detailed, but Hillary is the first person to use the word innocibilitas, which is like in, in generacy. the Greek is agonesia. Um, it's basically the not bornness of the father. Um, so the distinction between the father and the son uh, within the divine being is a relational distinction. You can only pick it out by talking about both of them at once. Um, and you can say, this one is born, this one is not born. So that word, I mean, that word gets just hardwired into the Latin Trinitarian tradition. Um, you know, it's got its Greek uh, correspondence, but um, Aquinas is just constantly, Aquinas and Bonaventure, you know, a thousand years later are using in um, is as the main thing in, in their talking about the Father. So big advantage there. Having said that, and then all of that is true of on the Trinity. Um, Hillary writes, again, let me get these dates. Hillary writes on the Trinity um, in 360. Um, and then he's restored from his exile in 361 and starts writing a commentary on the Psalms in 364. And then he seems to, I think he dies by 367. When he returns um, to his bishopric there in Poitiers, and he's written on the Trinity, and then he, he turns and starts working through the Psalms. For one thing, his Psalms commentary is just beautiful. Um, he really starts developing this prosoponic exegesis where you say, this voice is the speaking of the Father. This voice is the speaking of the Son. Hillary has a fantastic development of this prosoponic exegesis, picking out the persons of the Trinity, speaking in the words of the Old Testament Psalms. Um, it's just, it's really rich. I haven't seen people do quite enough with it because it's all just sort of sitting there on the pages. Um, there is a recent article, 2016 article by Ellen Scully in the Journal of Early Christian Studies that points out that in the Psalms commentary, Hillary doesn't use the word birth to refer to the origin of the son. Um, he starts making a distinction and instead talking about using another word about generating um, or begetting in order to avoid using the same word birth um, both of the son's incarnation and of the son's eternal origin from the father. Um, Scully believes that this is because he's come into contact with more developed Arian teaching and has realized some of the problems that talking about the two births of the son can get you into. Um, I mean, by that time, by, um, 
by that far in the fourth century, he's going to be coming into contact maybe with Neo-Arianism, um, a kind of a rationalistic Arianism um, that's a more, more logic choppy. So it could be that under that pressure, um, he moves in another direction. So I still think what the histories of dogma say is correct if you're talking about on the Trinity, um, that one of the main contributions he makes there is developing his Trinitarian theology around the father-son relationship and around the idea of the two births of the son. Well, let me wrap this up just by sounding a slightly Wesleyan note. Um, his submission, um, Hillary's submission to divine revelation, uh, I think is one of the major mega messages of his on the Trinity. So he's constantly bringing himself to the voice of God in the word of God and submitting himself to the one who is the most fitting witness of his own being and identity. So he listens to that. Um, and he emphasizes that when you do that, the reward is not just that you are obedient by submitting to revelation or you admit your weaknesses or something like that, though there is, there is ascetic value in that, admitting the limitations of your own understanding to grasp God. But he says, what happens is it unlocks your understanding. So, you know, there's that patristic maxim, um, you have to believe in order to understand. And Hillary has his own version of that. He says that in one, in book one, section 12, he says, with the will to believe comes the power to understand. Um, I, I think there's, there's something there about um, uh, uh, being the, the human subject who makes the decision to submit to God um, and how you're empowered by God to do that. Faith is still a divine work, but there's something that lines up the faculties of the soul uh, when the human subject responds in that way. Um, I think that shows up also in Hillary's soteriology, though he's mainly doing Trinitarian theology, he's always doing it with an eye on the gospel and with uh, developing a relationship with God. So in 111, Hillary says, uh, as he was learning this truth of who the highest good is, he says, my soul learned also um, that the sonship to God, he's talking about human created sonship to God, my soul learned that this sonship to God is not a compulsion, but a possibility. For while the divine gift is offered to all, it is no heredity inevitably imprinted, but a prize awarded to willing choice. So um, it, it's interesting to get this uh, pro-Nicene Latin voice that is not Augustine's, because there are certain things Augustine is just going to not tend to say, um, given some of his soteriological decisions. Uh, but I think in Hillary, I'm not going to try to go in and, and, and pick Hillary as the uh, Wesleyan of the fourth century or anything like that. But he... Um, he is a little bit more like John Cassian in this way. And so he kind of uh, lines up with that side of the tradition more. All right, well, that's what I've got on Hillary's on the Trinity. Yeah, well, that last comment is very interesting to me. Uh, aligning more with the, of course, he's, uh, he is coming from that area of the world, right? Yeah. As John Cassian did. So that seems to be, uh, the the later controversy seems to really be be geographic in that sense. Uh, let just a little bit of uh, a history here. Could you comment on the the power of Arianism in the church during this particular era? Because this is a really important era in the in the church. Yeah, so I know the story of the Cappadocians a little bit better, um, where with the Cappadocians, you know, in Asia Minor, you get, um, you reach a point where the descendants of Constantine um, are less and less competent, you know, mm -hmm. Constantine, say what you will about him, but he was, boy, was he ever a manager of imperial scope. <laughs> and um, so when he becomes Christian and, um uh, lists Christianity among the uh, permitted religions, and um, when all that happens, that's great, but then he's baptized on his deathbed by an Arian, and then his offspring are all just rabid Arians, um, and that's just a real problem. So the pro-Nicenes are really disempowered for, for those decades. It's at the end of that period, at the end of the, um, like in the 370s, really, the late 360s, early 370s, you get just organizational geniuses like Basil of Caesarea, who are just, they are literally capable of outthinking the emperor. So they don't have more power. They just think like, well, look, all you got to do is get the right number of bishops in the right places and you've got a network and plan. So he starts, you know, 
he appoints his uh, his brother and his college roommate as bishops. And like the next thing you know, uh, you can actually uh, pull this thing together. Of course, the whole time they're teaching powerfully and reminding Christians, like, you don't believe that Jesus isn't divine stuff. Um, so Basil, or, I'm sorry, Hillary, um, is aligned with that movement, that sort of pro-Nicene theology from the underside by people often in exile, uh, which all kind of comes comes to fruition, you know, right around 380. And, mm -hmm. you know, is symbolized by the um, Council of Constantinople, which is where we actually get the Nicene Creed that we say now, the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed of 381. But nobody wants to say that, so we call it the Nicene Creed. Right. <laughs> So, so exile was pretty much always a threat during this time for the Nicene defenders, right? And this was obviously Athanasius and, and Hillary, others from both Egypt and, and Gaul are exiled as well. And then you have the, the famous confrontation later of, by, by Ambrose, right? A lot of interesting history there. Well, let's... Um, I have a question, but uh, Jonathan Arnold has a question that we're just going to combine. So, uh, Jonathan, I think the first question that you shared with me earlier, would you go ahead and, and uh, pose that one? Sure. So it actually um, relates to uh, Dr. Sanders' final point there. Uh, I was moved by Hillary's just general reticence to explain the Trinity. He keeps circling around to, you know, this ineffable birth and it almost seems like frustrated, you know, by the heretics that they have forced him to be so bold as to speak of these divine mysteries. So uh, I was thinking about how this relates to Trinity Sunday in a couple days. And it is the time of the year that maybe some pastors will, for the first time, uh, teach explicitly a, a whole sermon or lesson on the Trinity. And, um, and I've had mixed feelings about that. And how do we make the most of it? Uh, ben Myers once asked, how do we combat Trinitarian heresies? Start by abolishing Trinity Sunday, that fateful day on which preachers think they have to explain it. And uh, I wonder, how, how do we take advantage of this right around the corner? And, and then just more generally, your comments on teaching and preaching on the Trinity in the local church. What can we learn from Hillary? Yeah, I'm going to try to talk over my dog who's gone mad in the other part of the house here. And I have no control over him, so hope it doesn't pick up too much on the mic. Um, yeah, I think the best way to think about um, Trinity Sunday, of course, it's a much later development in church history. You know, it's it's fairly recent. It's, um, I, I, again, I can't do the numbers off the top of my head, but it's um, you don't get like the fifth century church thinking, what do we do about Trinity Sunday? Because it, it wasn't around. And one reason it's an odd fit in the church calendar is it's not an event, right? The church calendar is primarily framed around events in the history of salvation. And contra Rahner and much of the Trinitarian Renaissance of the 20th century, the Trinity is not an event in salvation history, right? <laughs> the Trinity is the eternal God. So it doesn't quite fit the church calendar. Nevertheless, it was added in a place that you can take really great advantage of. There's a, there's a real rationale um, to putting it where it is. Um, you complete the cycle of commemoration of the life of Jesus, um, especially with the Ascension, followed by Pentecost. Once you've got the enthronement of Christ at the right hand of the Father, and on the basis of his finished work, the Spirit being sent in this new new covenant way, um, that, that is, it's, the, it's almost a logical corollary. It's like the other side of the fact that God is with us and that the Son is on the throne. Um, and the Spirit is among us. God is with us in that way, too, because on the basis of the Son's finished work, the Spirit is here. Um, that's all the elements you need for the clear teaching of the Trinity. Um, my view of bi the biblical revelation of the Trinity is that God was always triune, wasn't especially in the business of teaching that fact clearly until the epochal sending of the Son and the Spirit in the Incarnation and Pentecost. Now, I'm willing to look back at the Old Testament, or as my Old Testament scholar friend calls it, most of the Bible. Right? I'm willing to look back at the Old Testament and say, um, there are lots of fascinating phenomena going on there. We could look at the, the series of statements about the angel of the Lord. Um, but the language that's always used for what's going on with the Trinity in the Old Testament is adumbration. Right? It's a shadowing forth of the triunity of God. And I'm, I'm just temperamentally inclined to say, 
Well, if it's an adumbration, then it's at least not a clear and evident revelation. And so I would save the clear and evident manifestation revelation for those events marked by the end of that sequence in the church year. To my mind, that's the way to go. If you're in a liturgical church that's marking congregationally the Christian year, uh, you got to kind of take a running start at Trinity Sunday, you know, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. the Ascension, Pentecost, now Trinity Sunday. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, let's let's talk about eternal generation, and um, I'm interested in in how Hillary what Hillary has to do with your. Um, I've not read the one that I, I think you co-edited with uh, Scott Swain. Right. right. Um, so I'm interested in that. I need to just read it. Uh, but I think also Jonathan wanted to ask something specific about eternal generation as well. Uh, yeah, so Hillary, you know, repeats over and over that because of the son's uh, birth, the son is both distinct from the father, but also the same nature with the father. You know, a son is not his father, but a son is also the same nature of his father. Um, the son is God by his birth from God, but also distinct as the begotten son of the unbegotten. And he just goes over that again and again and again and again. So uh, something that kept coming to mind is, you know, there's a lot of people who would affirm both of those things. The father and son are distinct persons. The son is fully God. Uh, but what is lost when we deny or overlook eternal generation? Uh, it seems like it really unravels the logic of, of Nicene theology. Um, and then on the more positive way of stating that question, how can retrieving the doctrine strengthen our understanding of God and the gospel? Yeah, yeah, that's good. And, and because um, there hasn't been as much systematic theology written in dialogue with Hillary as I would like to have seen. You know, I've, I've read a lot of pages of, of uh, constructive systematic theology using Aquinas, using Augustine. Um, I'd really like to see a little more engagement with Hillary because I'm not totally sure. I mean, if I'm honest, I'm not totally sure how he relates those things and if that's the right way to relate them. I'd like to see that sort of drawn out. It's, it's almost like we're talking about causation, right? It's like the the generation causes the homoousios, or should you say it vice versa, or should you not talk about causation, or how do you kind of establish grounding relationships in there? I'm, so I'm just admitting like, that's a little area I'd like to work on and think a little harder about. Um, I can say that in general, eternal generation, however you relate it to homoousios, and they're, they're clearly tightly, tightly bound, right? Um, the son is of the father and that's what that's how we know that the son is of the same essence of the father not just some other guy with some similar essence or some other guy with the same exact kind of essence but the identically same essence right um those those two do go together closely if you try to be a trinitarian without affirming eternal generation you have a kind of a brittle trinitarianism that um maybe this is too ironic to put it this way uh, because a lot of people who object to eternal generation do so because it's not directly stated in the Bible to their satisfaction. Um, but you end up with a brittle kind of um, just give me the exact words to memorize and I will say them back to you kind of Trinitarianism. Like the father is father because he's father and the son is son because he's son. The invitation to explore the concept of eternal generation is to say, are there any verbs you can use between father and son? Like what? Tell me about that father-son relation. If you deny eternal generation, you just have to go back and say it again. Father is father, son is son. Well, how so? Well, the father has a characteristic that defines him as father. Let's call it fatherhood. And the son has a characteristic, a personal characteristic marking him out as son. Let's call it sonhood. Um, and what you're missing there is the, the actual relation, right? You have to get to a place where you state the relation as something more than just reiteration of the nouns. Eternal generation gets you that. Now, I, and I, I'm also uh, robustly convinced that it's biblical, right? That, you know, it kind of flows directly out of the way the Bible makes this known. So that's a, on the negative side, you end up with a brittle kind of just give me the words and I'll repeat them formulaically. Um, one way I put this is that is a, that's a style of Trinitarian theologizing it's not heretical. It's not deficient even necessarily, though it is deficient to actively deny the eternal generation. It's a style that you see represented in the Athanasian Creed, right? the, the so-called Athanasian so-called creed that has that sort of the Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Spirit eternal, but there are not three eternals, but one eternal. 
you see how that's kind of working? You, just, you want to draw the triangular diagram every time you're reciting the Athanasian Creed because that's how it's set up. And very little said in that main famous part of the Athanasian Creed about any relations among the three. Mm -hmm. It's not about the relations among the three, it's about the relations of the three to the one, not of the relation of the father to the son. So that's one style. The other style though is the Nicene style, which is all about the son's relation to the father, right? Homoousios is not a, a statement about the three and the one. Homoousios is a statement about the father and the son. And you include the spirit, you know. Um, so on the real upside, of course, when I'm in salesman mode for eternal generation, uh, the pitch is the reason it is wise of God to have made this known this way in scripture is because the direct line straight through to our adoption as sons is obvious. It's right there in the package, right? What the second person of the Trinity is by nature, uh, is ex that relationship is extended to us by grace in a mode appropriate to our creaturehood. Mm, mm, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I do want to mention to the others who are in this um, uh, meeting now, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And uh, Jonathan, if you'll help keep track of that, um, feel free to do that. Uh, follow up there on eternal generation. So this has gotten a lot of attention in the last quite a few years. What has, what has a really, brought that back to people's mind, eternal generation and the importance of it? Yeah, in general, there's a lot of um, healthy movements in evangelicalism to reclaim the great tradition and um, kind of realign with that and be more informed by uh, the whole history of, of Christian reflection on scripture. Um, several years ago, a, a few of us um, who were attending the Evangelical Theological Society just began to notice we were hitting a critical mass of people, you know, otherwise good theologians and Christian brothers and sisters denying eternal generation. Uh, and it just seemed like, you know, it wasn't a conspiracy or anything. It was just a couple more papers every year, you know, a couple, two, a couple, three, four, you're getting up there. And at some point you think, all right, somebody's got to do something about this. So um, just amongst ourselves, we just started generating more defenses of eternal generation and in particular um trying to find the persuasion points because we, we we thought well we're not fighting arians here we're just fighting people who are wrong about some important points of theology mm -hmm. they're probably wrong for the right reasons like if they think it's not in the bible well that's a good reason to not believe in it so um all right well let's deal with them where they are and try to demonstrate so i think roughly half that uh, book that scott swain and i edited is um uh, biblical stuff. Like we literally sat down and thought, can someone write about the word monogenes and argue how it's connected to the idea of eternal generation? Can we get D.A. Carson to write on the gospel of John and say, you can teach eternal generation without using those words. It's, it's all, the concepts are all there in John 5. Can we get someone to look at Hebrews 1 where the son is the radiance of the glory of the father? Again, to say the words eternal generation are not there in Hebrews 1, but the conceptuality is there in light imagery. Um, and so I, uh, I think that a lot, people are open to those arguments, and so there's just been, um, in a number of ways, a lot of people rehearsing the biblical foundation for eternal generation. The great thing is, if you're persuaded on those grounds, then you're kind of welcome to back into the great tradition of Christian thought, because if you're iffy on eternal generation, you're not going to have any fun reading Hillary. Um, mm -hmm. You're not going to understand anything after book three of Augustine's On the Trinity. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of the cost of admission. Mm-hmm. Good. Mark uh, Burr. Jonathan. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Mark Burr. I think they've had one other question too, so go ahead. Yeah, I'll just share this quick. Uh Mark Bird asked if there's any movement in Bible translation to go back to only begotten in John three sixteen. Yeah, I haven't heard of any. Um I mean what's new there I think is the argument that Lee Irons puts forward. It's a kind of a it's a lexical argument based on all the different ways compounds are formed with Ganes. Um, it's a computer assisted lexical argument. So um, it's, 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 it's a pretty nice argument. Um, and it does seem to be that, for instance, when the ancient church looked at monogenes and said, oh, in Latin, that would be unigenitus. Like they were basically saying only begotten is right. Um, and um, I, I've always been, always, I have always been of the view that the doctrine of eternal generation um, does not depend on how you translate or even how you understand 
monogenes, you know, the five times it occurs in John's writings. Um, but it, it's handy if it, if it goes along with it. Um, it's also handy if you're doing a Bible study with your great grandma and she says only begotten. And, uh, you know, you're just saying John 3.16 together and right there in the middle of it, you say unique and she says only begotten. Um, that's annoying. So mm -hmm. if truth is on its side, it would be handy to be able to go back to only begotten. But I'm not aware of any Bible translation committees who have um, considered that yet. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, I, I know we have, uh, Jonathan, did you have one more question you wanted to pose? And then well, we I have... might, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this is, uh, we have time for this, but I wonder how this relates to the, the arguments over functional subordination. Would you be able to kind of give us the, the quick understanding of why it is that, that the people who tend to be on the side of eternal functional subordination tend to reject eternal generation? And those who are on the side of eternal generation tend to reject eternal functional subordination. What is the correlation there? <laughs> yeah, um, it's not a perfect correlation. And I think there's even movement going on since 2016 on that front. Um, but in, in my opinion, eternal generation is a, it's a doctrine that actually does some work. Like in, in architectural terms, it's a load bearing wall, you know, you, call the contractor in to see if you can take this out and open up some space, some space into the living room. And they say, no, if you, that's actually holding up the roof here. You cannot remove that. It's not a cosmetic wall. It's a load bearing wall. Um, and the load it bears is it, it is the biblical and traditional answer to the question, what is the difference between the father and the son? The, the difference or distinction between the father and the son can only be relationally stated. And that relational statement is, the father begets the son and not vice versa. If you're not convinced of that, um, it's not like you just eliminate one little line item veto element from your theology. You actually are now searching for a different answer to the question, what is the distinction between the father and the son? And I think that's dangerous. You're going to come up with, you could understand why you might come up with like, well, the son sure does obey the father joyfully in the economy. Maybe that goes all the way back. And that would give us an answer to this question. What's the difference between the father and the son? That would only occur to you if you didn't already start by being fully satisfied with the answer eternal generation. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my sense of why that, that correlates roughly in that way. Mm -hmm. that part of the work eternal generation can do in your theology mm -hmm. is satisfy you and call you off the quest to keep searching as if someday you'll find out what the difference is between the father and the son. Mm -hmm. Mm, very good. Because I know a lot of people, you can, you can talk into eternal generation, but they go, yeah, but why does it matter? Yeah, and mm. I'm thinking, well, it matters because that's why we believe in the Trinity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> L let's, let's take uh, the last several minutes here, and we, we love to close with uh, something doxological, something pastoral. And uh, we have uh, one of our members here. Uh, Mark Bird, who is uh, getting ready, actually putting together a dissertation proposal, correct? And uh, would you uh, tell us just a little bit, uh, Mark, about that? And I think you um, have a question that has to do with Trinitarian prayer in the early church. Yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't expect you to, to ask me something like this. So again, what, what's the first question? Yeah, so you're yeah, you're, you're working, working on your proposal yeah. now, and yeah. uh, you are looking particularly at early prayers addressed to, uh, to the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Right, particularly, um, yes, in, in, the, in the first and second century, third century. So I especially want to see, see if there's some real apologetic value to early prayers to Jesus, why were they praying to Jesus? I mean, I suspect it has something to do with the fact that he claimed to be one with the Father and that he rose from the dead, and they saw that, they saw the connection there, and they, you know, they were exalted, worshiping him as the Lord of life, victor over death. Mm -hmm. But I'm interested, partly for evangelistic purposes, what can I demonstrate to skeptics, to, 
to show them that, hey, listen, there's, there's got to be a reason why they pray. They were praying. They were, they were affirming him as, as divine by, by through their prayers to him, mm-hmm. not, just, not just through him, but to him even. Mm-hmm. And very early on, first century, second century, and, and, and there was continuity. This, this, this pushed itself into the, the larger tradition. And so I wanted to, to ask you, um, I know there's some doxological value to this as well, mm-hmm. but, but I'm most interested in the apologetic value. And if I, if I, and I, I want to talk to you personally sometime about this. So, so, uh, so let's put, let's yeah, put both so, of those out there. Yeah, let's, let's put both of them. Because uh, yeah, I'm interested in the doxological value. Well, <laughs> well, I am too. I'm very much interested in it. But they're telling me, yeah, you have to choose, you know. Uh, I don't yeah, know yeah. if you have to choose. <laughs> I don't know if I have to choose. Yeah, I, uh, I, you, you probably don't have to choose. It's it's a matter of getting clear on on what you're trying to do with this. And there's, um, oh gosh, there's an essay on the, T.F. Torrance always quoted this essay on the problem of Apollinarianism in the liturgy. Um uh, that'd be something worth looking up because he's it's sort of the difference that basil gets into in his book on the holy spirit about do you pray to the father and the son and the holy spirit or do you pr- pray to the father through the son in the holy spirit it's like right. those prepositions those little words turn out to have all the theology in them right? Right. Right. Um, but it's not like they contradict each other it's not like either you're on team father son and spirit or team father in uh, through son in the spirit um, they're both they're both accurate in different registers. I've mostly emphasized the the sort of what I call praying with the grain of mediation, right? That you, you come to the Father through the Son, so your attention is more focused on the Father, but the mediation of the Son is present to your awareness. The power of the Holy Spirit is likely not present to your consciousness at all, because it sort of, it is being your consciousness of the Father and the Son, right? If, if you're praying and it's working, it's because the spirit is working in you through the son to get you to the father. Um, and so that's what I've emphasized, but I always, you know, balance that with, listen, the rule is something like you can pray to any person who's God. So you got at least three options, <laughs> maybe four, because you could just pray to God without having a Trinitarian thought anywhere in your conscious mind. Mm-hmm. And you're still praying to a person who is God, not because God is unipersonal, but because, you know, without having to thematize it, the, Theologically, you're still encountering a spiritual reality. When a traffic accident happens and I say, God help them, I don't think my prayer goes to a dead letter office in heaven because they're like, well, it's not addressed to any of the three of us. (laughs) (laughs) But there is a Baptist theologian, Augustus Strong, who used to argue that you can say whatever you want about the deity of Christ, but unless you will pray to him as God, you don't really believe he's God. Hmm. And I think, yeah, that's right, actually. So even though I mostly emphasize praying with the grain of mediation in the name of Jesus through the Son, um, I also think there's something, and it's directly biblical, right? Prayers right. to the Son as God. Yeah, I've done a lot of looking at that. I went to a kingdom hall one time, and the el- one of the elders up there said, you know, we only pray to, the Je- to Jehovah, we don't pray to Jesus. Hmm. I-, I asked him afterwards, one of, one of the elders. I said, so why don't you why don't you pray to Jesus? Well, he's not Jehovah. He's not God. Yeah. That, that was their argument. The That's reverse. a good reason not to pray to Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> so so, so pastorally, um, there are people who who hear us use always refer to Jesus as the Son of God. We pray to the Father often, you know, in Jesus' name. And so I think there is a um uh, pedagogical issue here with with teaching Trini- thoroughly trinitarian theology and i know pastorally i have uh, especially in this season of uh, leading up to pentecost i have prayed pastoral prayers addressing to the father and then a section to the son and then the section to the holy spirit and and so i think as pastors uh, there is there are many ways to let people know that when we are using language of son of God, we're not using it in an adoptive sense. We are praying to Christ uh, as, as God. And uh, I, I think that's important. I think uh, maybe Jonathan had told me a story uh, some time ago about uh, someone who was really stumbling over that 
that sonship and adoption idea, which I think is probably the most common thing that I encounter in people's uh, trouble in understanding Trinitarian uh, theology is making that connection of, of um, sonship. And you've addressed that in eternal generation. I think that's, that's very good. Well, I think we will uh, close here, and as we uh, bring this discussion to a close, uh, let me just share uh, this uh, benediction from uh, Scripture itself, from Second uh, Corinthians uh, thirteen fourteen: uh, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So God bless you, and uh, thank you for being here. And to those who will watch later, uh, we trust that this will be a blessing to you. Thank you, Dr. Sanders, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Good to see you all.